welcome to the fourth annual national discussion on government openness uh, to help end a successful Sunshine Week. Uh, often we kick off Sunshine Week, but this year we're, we're bringing up the end. I'm your moderator, Patrice McDermott, the director of OpenTheGovernment.org, and we have a nice banner there in the front if you can see it. Our co-sponsors for this event are the American Association of Law Libraries, the American Library Association, Association of Research <coughs> Libraries, Center for American Progress, League of Women Voters, National Freedom of Information Coalition, Public Citizen, Special Libraries Association, Sunshine Week, and Sunlight Foundation. And we appreciate all of our partners and others who have helped to um, get word out about this event. I am grateful to my co-sponsors for their help in creating this event and making it a success. This year, we are webcasting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, DC. I want to thank John Podesta, President and CEO of CAP, for graciously hosting this event for us this year. The Center is a partner in OpenTheGovernment.org, which is a coalition of organizations committed to promoting government openness and accountability and pushing back secrecy. CAP is also on our steering committee, and Reese Rushing, who is here in the audience, is, is one of our committee members. The staff at CAP has been wonderfully helpful to us and very patient. As always, we thank all of you who are joining us live in the studio and those of you watching at meetings in your communities or from your computers at your office or on your bed or wherever you're watching from. <laughs> Remote audiences, please call in or email questions throughout the show uh, to email. You can send the um, questions to questions at OpenTheGovernment.org, questions at OpenTheGovernment.org, or you can call to 202-478-5325 or 202-478-5326. Please be aware that we will not be able to get to all of you, but we will do our best. As many of you know, I hope everybody in this room knows. On his first day in office, President Obama sent a memorandum to his administration on transparency and open government, asking them um, to develop recommendations for an open government directive that moves government toward being transparent, participatory, and collaborative. Exciting times and much different from our past administration of course, as we celebrate Sunshine Week, we are excited and curious about the changes ahead. And just yesterday, the Attorney General issued the new Freedom of Act um, FOIA guidelines. We have them posted on our site. I know a number of people in this audience also have them posted on their site. Our website is www.openthegovernment.org, and many of our partners have them up as well. They build on, codify, as it were, and expand to some extent the um, directives that President Obama gave the first day uh, that he was in office. Today we have a panel of distinguished guests to discuss what the Obama administration hopes to achieve with the new directive, the vision for e-government, the plans for financial and economic transparency, and the policy issues and opportunities facing this administration. We are honored to welcome today Vivek Kundra, the Chief Federal, the Federal Chief Information Officer for this administration. He formerly served in Mayor Fenty's uh, cabinet as the Chief Technology Officer for the District of Columbia, and in 2008 was recognized as the IT Executive of the Year. Next, we also welcome Dr. Beth Novick, who is heading up the implementation of the President's Memorandum on Transparency and Open Government out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and who has previously directed the Institute for Information and Law Policy at the New York Law School. And I, I recommend her writings uh, to you, particularly uh, her wiki government. Dan, oh, let's got, we're out of order. Catherine McFate is a program officer for government performance and accountability in the Ford Foundation's Governance and Civil Society Unit where she examines and promotes the role of the state in achieving peace and social justice in the United States and beyond. And last but not least, Dan Chenek, who was a member of the President's Technology, Innovation, and Government Reform, or TIGR, team 
uh, transition team. He was also a former branch chief for information policy and technology in the Office of um, Management and Budget, and he's currently senior vice president of Pragmatics. We thank each of you for joining us here today. So Vivek, let's start with you. You are in charge of e-government and information technology, if I'm right, for the executive branch. What are the plans of the administration in those fields? Um, so a couple of uh, big things that, uh, that we have uh, planned out in terms of embracing uh, open government, driving that agenda, and as you mentioned, uh, that was the president's first memorandum, uh, and it shows you the commitment of this administration to an open, transparent government. Uh, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about the, uh, give you some context as far as the federal government is concerned. You've got over 10,000 systems, and a lot of these systems, frankly, you know, are deployed with technologies that are 20 to 30 years old. So part of what we're looking at is rationalizing $71 billion of spend on information technology to look at the procurement process and say, well, how do we ensure that from the very beginning we bake transparency into how we procure technology uh, and how we architect systems? So we begin with a default understanding that systems and information will be transparent rather than a default uh, view that we're going to begin by closing everything up and then arbitrarily decide what will and will not be transparent. Second thing we have to uh, recognize is that uh, you know, as we look at the economic crisis we're in and the two wars that we're in the middle of, is that as a function of priorities and ensuring that uh, from a transparency perspective, it's more important now than ever. And how do we make sure, from that perspective, that we put data and information in the hands of the public? Uh, a good example of where we've begun is uh, the Recovery Act implementation with the launch of recovery.gov. And as more and more money flows out, uh, more and more data will be available uh, in the coming months uh, and weeks ahead. But the challenge also we have to recognize is that it's not going to happen overnight and it won't be easy. And we're ensuring that from an agency perspective, as uh, money is spent, that you're able to track it. And we're going to have to look at it from a perspective of an ecosystem, not just the federal government putting out that information, but also relying on organizations such as yours uh, and the Sunlight Foundation to help us look at that data that's democratized and look at patterns so that we can hold people accountable, we can hold public officials accountable whether that's at the federal level, state level, or local level, and the private sector for that matter. And one of the initiatives we plan to launch is the data.gov, where we plan to transform the way the federal government pushes out information. And think of two examples that I love to use. Or one is what uh, the NIH did with the Human Genome Project. Uh, what it decided to do is put out all that information uh, in the public domain rather than locking it up. There's a classical battle going on between Craig Venter and Francis Collins uh, in the 90s when it came to the Human Genome Project, and there was a shotgun technique you know, on the private sector side versus what the NIH was doing in terms of decoding the human genome. But with other world bodies in the NIH, when that information was put out in the public domain, what we saw was massive explosion in discovery uh, in medicine, and also personalized medicine for that matter. Same way, another example is what happened with the Department of Defense and satellites. When the Defense Department decided to release the coordinates of that information, you were able to create a whole new industry around geospatial, and you were able to navigate all across the country. And for that matter, we're looking at vast array of data that the federal government has and we're going line item by line item and figuring out how do we quickly put that in the public domain and ensure that it's easy to use, easy to process, and readily available. Thank you. And by the way, we're going to do questions from the audience live and remote at the end of all of these presentations, not at the end of each speaker. Uh, Vivek, one of the concerns that we hear expressed regularly is that the CIOs across the executive branch are too focused on technology for what seems its own sake, on the tubes and the wires and that, and don't seem to understand or care 
that the technology is a medium for information in all formats, not just data. Uh, what will your office do to address these concerns? Sure, so one of the things we're looking at is a context-driven government. Um, rather than um, uh, the, the old way of thinking about the public sector has been that we connect people to agencies and bureaucracies rather than services. So the federal government currently has over 24,000 websites. Imagine if you're looking for a service, how taxing that is for an individual uh, to connect to a service. And traditionally, the role of the CIOs, and, and this is a function of self-image of the CIO too, I would argue, has been to just focus on silicon and zeros and ones uh, rather than to look at the power of technology and leveraging technology to fundamentally transform the way the government works. And by context driven, what we need to do is recognize that if you look at certain sites, whether it's Craigslist or Facebook or a number of other sites, they have more users. If you, let's take Facebook for example. We're over 138 million users versus the number of hits an agency website would get. So the question for us from a government perspective is to figure out how do we get government services embedded in those social networks so that with the digital economy, we're not going back and architecting systems and the way we deploy services the same way and to the same thinking as we were with the physical world and the limitations of the physical world. So we have a great opportunity here and that's one of the challenges for the CIO community is to look at that $71 billion, rationalize it, but at the same time, move it towards a context-driven government. I think one of our other questions then is about, uh, one of the things we hear in our community is, is concern about that vast amount of money that's going to purchase technology, and I understand the context-driven, but how is, are there opportunities through the budget process to um, bring agency, and I know you're not the budget officer, but <laughs> to bring agencies to be more transparent, to take that, what seems to us on the outside, an enormous amount of money, maybe not so much in the government, but on the inside, outside it is, and turn that around to, uh, to get those CIOs to, to not just think about the context, but to spend some of that money in providing information. Sure. And I think part of that uh, has to do with the DNA of the government and making sure that the CIOs share a philosophy of an open and transparent government and recognize that technology is one element, it's not the solution. And how do we ensure that it's one, baked into the DNA of uh, the, the government, as you can see, the president is committed to that. Secondly, it, when we look at the procurement process, ensuring that we bake that up front into how we procure technologies, how we procure solutions, with a default, setting, a default setting of ensuring that we will favor solutions that provide greater transparency in open government rather than solutions that are gonna close down uh, information. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we favor solutions that are gonna make it easier for the public to be able to access you know, how their government works. And a worldview that it's about we the people. The government belongs to we the people. And we need to ensure that people actually have access and understand how their government works. And all the processes throughout the federal government, we need to ensure that we are actually shining sunlight and leveraging technology to make that happen. I guess a follow on is um, the, the sunlight and shining the sunlight, but what are the carrots and sticks to actually get the CIOs to, to do this. Um, it, it's wonderful, and I'll just say that you know, that's what the administration wants them to do, but, but what are, like I said, the carrots and sticks to actually get them to do it? So, I'll, I mean, from my personal experience, um, what, what I've found is transparency is not just good government. It fundamentally <coughs> changes the way um, you deploy technology and solutions. So you can see a 60, 70% X uh, drop in cost, because now the government doesn't have to deploy a solution on its own. Uh, just through the data.gov model, we could engage the public to help us build solutions and solve some of the biggest problems in the federal government. Um, whether those are specialized in healthcare, in education, or in public safety, uh, you can actually engage the public to deploy solutions that uh, not only are lower in cost, but far more innovative. 
you're looking at a federal workforce of about four million people plus, but if you can tap into the ingenuity and the innovation of 300 million Americans, we could fundamentally change the way we roll out technologies. Okay, and that, that leads us in very nicely actually to, to Beth, uh, the uh, participation and collaboration and transparency. Beth, you have a lead role in development of the Open Government Directive called for by the President. Can you tell us some of the, uh, something about the kinds of things the President hopes to achieve through this directive and with, for this audience, uh, a special focus on the transparency aspect? Sure. First, let me say thank you very much for having me, for having all of us here today. It is such a pleasure, particularly during Sunshine Week, to be among such an uh, engaged, enthusiastic, and committed group of people who share um, a deep belief in and commitment to and have worked for many years on pushing the agenda of transparency. It's really, I think, informed and led to the events we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Um, it started even before uh, the announcement on January 21st of the President's Memorandum on Transparency, throughout the campaign I think we saw the President's commitment to um, really trying to transform the way the government works, trying to bring new transparency to the effort. And that was signaled and reinforced then during the transition process when I had the pleasure to serve with several of the people on this panel in the um, famous, infamous Tigger uh, group where we did, it was fun, that's why we called it Tigger, um, and it was tr really a tremendous opportunity to be asked to focus on specific these, these issues of how we bring reform to government, how we bring greater transparency to the process. I also want to apologize at the outset for my cold, <laughs> that uh, I have simulcast going on in my head, it's not the webcast, it's happening in my own head, um, so I apologize for that. But um, what we're hoping to do here is really, as the memorandum I think puts it best, to try to drive three values into government uh, to even greater extent than we've seen before. Transparency, participation, and collaboration that have been mentioned. This is really about trying to bring innovation not only to technology more generally, but to the way that the public sector works, makes decisions, and makes policies. So that when we articulate a policy priority, whether it's improving the quality of education in this country or trying to um, develop clean energy proposals and improve our environment or trying to really uh, um, affect the other agenda uh, items that the president has and the administration has right front and center, first and foremost of which is of course the economy and creating new economic opportunity and jobs, that we innovate in the way we make the policies around the economy, education, health care, uh, the environment, energy, and all the areas in which the public sector is now working so that we bring about the most effective solutions to the tremendous problems that face us today. So in terms of what we're hoping to achieve in these three areas, I think um, I'm the only echoing what Vivek has said about transparency and some of the flagship initiatives that he and the CIO Council are driving, um, epitomized by projects like recovery.gov, by projects like data.gov. Um, we are engaged similarly in a parallel process to try to drive now the policy thinking that will help drive us towards greater transparency across the government um, and help us to really align our vision for greater transparency with the practices and the way that we've worked. This will not be a simple or easy or a quick win. It is not an easy process and it's not one that we complete by May 21st, the end of our 120 day mandate that we've been given by the President. It's really only the beginning of a process to change the culture of trying to drive uh, greater data about the workings of government and also the data and information of the government out into the open, make it available online and make it available for download and access to citizens so that we can create greater transparency and accountability and also create the kind of economic opportunity I think that you mentioned by releasing data online. I know there's a focus on transparency, but let me mention also participation and collaboration, if I might. <coughs> because the transparency effort is really about also trying to create opportunities for civic engagement and participation early in the policymaking process so that we can leverage as many of the minds, as you talked about, trying to bring everybody's work to bear. The President has talked about the sort of all hands on deck approach, trying to drive the expertise of the American public into the decision-making processes in government. And so that's where we're also looking and collaborating on how we think about using technology to get, improve the way that we make decisions and to get the benefit of the best expertise that we can. I might also point out that last week, the President also came out with a very major pronouncement on scientific integrity. And that's very much, I think, part and parcel of this initiative is trying to look at how we drive better scientific information of the highest quality into decision making and foster new opportunities for civic engagement and participation. And finally, collaboration. And all of these are driven by transparency and getting data out there and putting it in the hands of people. 
is the ability to collaborate both across government more effectively and between government and the American people and the private sector on solving the enormous problems that face us today. So we're trying to look at what are the policies, what are the processes, what are the technologies, and what are the cultural changes that we need to bring to bear in order to enable collaborations across those government silos so that in addition to delivering services um, more effectively, we're also making policy better, we're helping experts to find each other across the government people to reduce to reduce frankly the waste and the waste that happens when people are working in silos instead of collaboratively on, on solving problems and we're also committed to working as much as possible with across the boundary between not only federal state and local but also with the private sector so that we do bring all hands on deck to solving these challenges that means we're committed to doing a better job of articulating the problems that face us and the challenges that we're confronting so that the people in this room who are watching on the web, so that everyone out there can participate um, and try to drive solutions to do things in our own communities, not only with government, but again with communities, with interest groups in the private sector, to try to really meet the challenges, the enormous challenges that we're facing. So it will not be easy, um, and there's tremendous expectation, and that weighs heavily, and uh, we are grateful for the trust um, that you have put in us to try to work on these issues and hope that this will be a very collaborative dialogue and process. One of the questions uh, that has arisen in several of our, our meetings and when we've had discussions with you is, um, I suppose the best way to call it is, in addition to the culture, the cultural problems in many agencies, is sort of uh, strengthening the information infrastructure, uh, making sure that the laws uh, that are in place are implemented and overseen. And I wonder, um, you have mentioned several times in, in discussions records management. Um, I wonder if you could address like, some of those basic building blocks of transparency that need to be addressed and uh, how you see that playing in. So let me, let me say that there is definitely, um, you know, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House uh, where I sit has played uh, traditionally a very strong role as a convener um, and so, and again, this is, I think, why this process is being driven out of OSTP, because we view this as an extraordinarily collaborative process where we work with uh, OMB and the EGov group and the CIO Council, where we work with other parts and branches of government in trying to bring everybody into the solution of driving greater transparency, because we won't solve this through one document or one directive. Um, we have to have, really, an approach that addresses significant policy questions and issues, um, of which you've already mentioned one, in which there is a laundry list I know that people have prepared during their work today, work that is done in, as a run-up to this event, um, and work that was done today in the convening that happened this morning around developing that list of, of questions that really need to be answered from a policy perspective, as well as, again, also looking at how do we develop projects and programs, whether it's recovery.gov or data.gov or other hands-on projects that really demonstrate the effectiveness and importance of transparency and try to move us practically uh, towards those solutions. Um, and at the same time, there's the ability to get everybody really engaged in the solution, which is useful in driving really the cultural shift of getting people comfortable with the fact that transparency, radical transparency, really means that sunlight, that sunshine will be shined on things. And that's not always comfortable for people, and it's not always easy, and it does lead to criticism, and it does lead to um, finding out what we need to know. Um, and so that's not an easy process. So I really, the thing I most want to emphasize is not a laundry list of specific laws and rules and policies. We will be talking about our work more publicly on the web um, and engaging people in that dialogue about some of the specific issues, but really because I could only, it's a long list of things we have to look at, um, but it's a long list that we have to look at in collaboration with a large number of people and actors. And so we really view ourselves as a kind of innovation team, if you will, of different organizations around the government um, that are hoping to work with as many people as possible. And I will just say that we have been running an interagency um, dialogue process online to begin to generate much of that thinking and ideas about what needs to change and how do we change it, right. some of which may be done through traditional policy processes and some of which may be done by the great work that's being done over here that's really going to push us in the right direction towards transparency that no amount of policy pronouncements will bring about by itself. Great. So I'm going to go a little bit out of order of the introductions and go next to Dan Chenick, um, who I'm going to ask about some of the same policy issues. But Dan, you spent a lot of time 
on issues of federal information policy and practices when you worked at OMB and you were a part, of, again, of the Tigger transition team. What do you see as the biggest opportunities and challenges that faces administration in its efforts to make government more transparent and accountable? Thanks, Patrice. Thanks for your question, and thanks again for moderating, and thanks to the Center for hosting, and to all of you uh, for being here. It's a pleasure to be on a panel and to be reunited with, with Beth and Vivek and Catherine, so uh, it's a real um, uh, pleasure to be here, and we look forward to your, to your questions and to the discussion. Uh, as far as the opportunities go, and we talked a lot about this during the transition, during the run-up to the transition, Beth mentioned during the campaign, and uh, conversations were occurring then and, and since. There are a number of basic functions of government that transparency can make much more effective and efficient on behalf of the people who are being served. So think about service delivery. Uh, in, uh, much of what the government does is get information, benefits, um, dollars uh, out to people, out to individuals. So the more that people are aware of what those programs are, how effective they are, and where the, their they as individuals or perhaps the people that they're working with, the state and local governments, for example, in social services, are aware of where the money is, where the programs are, um, how good the programs are, are in terms of functioning and delivering the benefits that they're intended to deliver, the more effective the government will be in, in terms of the budget, the more effective the administration can then identify which programs are are working, where should money perhaps be reallocated to have a bigger bang for the buck, et cetera. So the government service delivery mission is certainly enabled. Uh, the, one of the roles of government is to ensure that the citizens who, after all, are the foundation of our government are informed about what the government's doing, even in, apart from particular service delivery elements and transactions. And so transparency can ensure that we as a nation uh, understand more, which has an important value in our democracy, of, uh, in terms of how well the confidence of the citizens is in the government, uh, trust that citizens have in their government. So transparency can enable those very basic elements of the functioning of, of how the government works in terms of serving citizens. An important next step in that is when the government actually develops policy through transparency and through, as Beth said, participation and collaboration, which really go hand in hand, the government can get input and citizens have a, a better way to participate in those processes, the transparency allows them to understand the government, and then they can participate and allow the government to make better decisions as a result, and thus uh, better policies will, will ensue. And then finally, I would argue that acceptance is important as an opportunity. Um, and acceptance by the citizenry of policies that they may have seen before as being involved in so, or designed in somewhat of a black box, uh, somewhat opaque, to the extent that they understand why the decisions were made, the data on that form the basis for those decisions and how those decisions are being carried out will lead to much more acceptance of the decisions uh, by the folks who are involved, by people who are benefiting from them, and hopefully things down the road like uh, lower litigation costs because people understand and don't feel the need to resort to other forms of, of reaction when they see a particular program because they'll have had a stake uh, in, the, in the formation. So that's all, all to the good. Patrice, you also asked about challenges. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I will, uh, since I'm not in the government right now, I'll go a little further than Beth did in terms of, of talking uh, a little bit about policy. Um, and again, the great work here today, I'm sure, highlighted many of these issues. But clearly, there is a perception. I don't think it's a reality. But there's a perception that open government means that there's somehow a less secure uh, government. And um, part of what uh, the challenge is is to building, as Vivek says, using the government processes and the OMB policies to ensure that as agencies are building transparent systems, they see security as really part of the solution that they're building. And tra there's a debate in the security community about security through obscurity versus security through transparency. And I think we're very much uh, looking to see the opportunity to this challenge as uh, identifying the security through transparency uh, element. Uh, another challenge, of course, is privacy. The more information that the government has on, uh, is about, that's about individuals and programs that serve individuals, the more important it is that agencies have to build in processes to protect privacy, both from a technology perspective and from a policy and use perspective. And a lot of that's about training uh, agencies and individuals who are getting information and how they best use that information. So that's <coughs> another challenge. Um, Patrice, you talked about records management, so I'll, I'll leave that one uh, uh, to the side because that's clearly something that uh, as we get more and more of, of wiki government and, and social networking techniques to identify and develop policies, how do we 
ensure that agencies are properly retaining records is, is uh, something that we can all work on together as a community. Uh, the last thing I'll say is the area of, of ownership. And this is something that I think we probably need to think more about. Um, the more the government uses third parties and transparent third parties, if you will, to articulate policies, the more the information that's used to both uh, develop the policy and also to make decisions that may have real impacts on people may be based on information that's not necessarily held by the government. It's held in a transparent way by a third party. Um, and so identifying what the uh, goal, what the responsibility of that third party is of the government agency making decisions and that sort of thing, I think we're going to need to all work together as a community to identify and sort through those issues. Okay. Just a quick follow-up. And, and you know that this was uh, a particular hot force of the public access community. And this will, I'll put this back out to everybody as a question, but I'll ask it to Dan right now. One of the things that our community sees as lacking, as a challenge, um, is that there is no leadership from the executive branch, or within the executive branch, to for government-wide policies. There's nobody talking about FOIA across the government, although the president did, uh, Eric Holder just did put out the FOIA guidelines. But there, there's no leadership from the White House on a broad information policy. We see the data.gov and data sorts of things are coming. But do you see that, now that you're not in government, a as a problem? Because I know you, you heard from a lot of us when you were in government mm -hmm. about the failure, particularly of OMB, to provide real leadership and vision across the government. Course, while I was at OMB, I heard about the... Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, we talked a lot about this during the transition. Right. Uh, and the, I think the signal that the, that the White House sent uh, when Vivek was announced as the uh, Chief Information Officer, which was not a title that had been used, um, demonstrates that there indeed is, uh, uh, and Vivek is, uh, We'll, we'll do an extraordinary job in bringing these issues together, working with the agencies, working with the, com with the uh, industry community, uh, in identifying and, and what are the policy issues, and Beth in her role working to bring these in through OSTP. And so it really is a, it's a team effort, and uh, the, the role of OMB has, is important, the role of OSTP is important, the role of the policy council, the role of federal chief information officers. But I think that you're seeing a commitment to the issue both in terms of technology and in terms of policy. And that's why, right. as Beth talked about, one of the main uh, I, actions during these 120 days is to identify what are the policies going forward that need to be issued or refined to implement the directive, and then how can, as Vivek will, will certainly uh, talk to us about and we'll see happen over the next months and years, how will OMB really work to implement those policies? So I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, things are moving in a, in a positive direction. Okay, great, thanks. Now, we're going to change gears a little bit uh, and, and go to Catherine McFaith. Catherine, you've been playing a key role in the efforts of the nonprofit community at both the federal and state and local levels, or the national and state and local levels, to ensure transparency and accountability in both the bailout and in the stimulus. What needs to be done in terms of policy and practice to make these programs more transparent and more accountable to the public? Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. I will answer that question in a minute, but I think we should just take one moment and savor this. <laughs> yes. This okay. is an amazing moment that we're in. Yes. Anybody who's working on transparency and accountability, and we should thank them for being here yes. and being part of this. So I needed to acknowledge you for yes. that, because this is a conversation we wouldn't have been having no. four months ago, obviously. <laughs> um, I've been working with a set of nonprofit public interest um, groups who came together in December to create something called the Coalition for an Accountable Recovery to try to push for certain kinds of accountability and transparency, particularly in the Recovery Act, um, that to ensure that this, the $787 billion that goes out is actually spent effectively, meets the social needs that we know are growing every day because of the economic crisis and really respond to public priorities. So there's three things that we've come up with, they've come up with, that are important um, in how we deal with Recovery Act. First, there's a request that every entity that receives Recovery Act money um, of more than $25,000 will actually report monthly to a centralized database um, answering what money it's spending, 
For what purpose are you reconstructing a school? Are you weatherizing houses? How's, how's the money being spent in terms of the broader purpose? And what, who have you hired? What jobs are you creating? What jobs are you saving? So that's the first act ask for the entities that are receiving money to actually be reporting to a centralized data set, recovery.gov. Second, that the information on that website will be publicly available and in a searchable format so that people can um, take it out, use it, manipulate it, be able to say, okay, this is how the Recovery Act money is being spent in my local community. This is how it's being spent in my city. This is how it's being spent in my state. Um, we want to see all the money that's being used to weatherize, all the money that's been used for public school construction. Those, so, so we want to be able to, to manipulate the data. And third, at the state level, we don't want to just look at tracking how the money's being spent, but we'd like to see the processes at the state and local level whereby decisions are being made about where that Recovery Act money is going. We'd like to see those um, processes, those decision-making <laughs> processes, to be more open, <coughs> transparent, and participatory. I have here, I have here a list. I have, a, I, and you can get this on progressivestates.org, um, accountable, re, um, accountablerecovery.net is a website you can go to to look at the Coalition for an Accountable Recovery. We'll put this up on the website. <laughs> okay. But um, we ha this is a list of what states are, the, the processes that states are attempting to establish to get out the recovery dot money, um, the, the Recovery Act money. Mm -hmm. Questions about um, who's responsible in terms of ultimate decision making, what the role of the legislature is, are there mandated public hearings, do they have a website, what's on the website. So we're trying to track how they're doing it, and there are 50 different ways it's being done which does not make citizen participation easy. Um, we are now there, but so, so these seem to be, um, on the face of them, pretty simple asks. We're asking that um, you report on who's getting the money, um, that there's a good website up that people can use, and that you open up the decision-making process. But of course, there are interests all over the place that will be um, resisting these. Uh, the first major challenge we have on the first ask, ask is the issue, of, um, the issue about private contractors, okay? Um, in most places, private contractors will resist telling you how they're spending the money, what jobs are being created, et cetera. And we think it's critically important that it's not simply the public entities that are receiving the funds, but anybody that they subcontract with all the way down the line, that we can track that money all the way down the line and down to the ground to where jobs, we hope, are being created. Um, just as an example, there's a GAO report that came out recently that um, said there, uh, there were, last year, there were $295 billion in overruns in defense contracting, just in the 95 contracts they looked at. That's 40% of the whole recovery package in one year in defense contracting that people weren't paying attention to. So we have to get inside the contracting. It can't just be the public agencies that are then doing the contracts with the private business, because we know that's going to happen. Um, second, the information on the website. A good example of how not to do it would be what happened with TARP, because um, people don't realize this, but under the bailout, under the bank <coughs> bailout, there actually were some kinds of transparency requirements that were built into that. They were supposed to do some kinds of reporting. But even in the two websites, that the Obama administration has, ne has now created to look at the information that's been collected, it comes in big chunks in PDF reports, so you can't get in, you can't search it, it's really hard to find the information. Um, the nonprofit sector, there are three websites for those at home who might want to look this up, for those of you in the audience. Um, bailoutwatch.org is one place. ProPublica um, and uh, the Center for Public Integrity and the Center for Investigative Reporting. All three of those organizations are doing a lot of very good investigative reporting about where the financial money is going, and it's taking a lot of work to be able to pull out the information that is available publicly and sift through it. So let's not do that again. Let's do it in a way that everyone in this room could go in and find the information that they need. Um, so, and then I talked already about all the different processes that are going on at the state and local level in terms of figuring out how and where to spend this money. So what can you do um, as citizens, as organizations? 
I would encourage you to look at the processes that are going on to, to go to coalition, um, the, the Coalition for an, an Accountable Recovery. Look at what they're doing if you're interested in this. For those of you at home who are on this website, I would encourage you to look at what your states and your localities are doing with the recovery money. If they have websites that they're creating, go look at the websites, see if you can track around because many of the, there's 40 states that say that they have web, websites um, relating to the Recovery Act. Now exactly what's on them and whether it's helpful is a whole nother question. So we need people on the ground to be looking at these websites. If they're not good, tell the people that created them that they're not good. Write letters to your governor, write letters to your state legislators, write op-eds, say that you need to have um, better information and you have a right to it. If they are good, if people are really struggling, tell us that too. We it would encourage you to write to the, the accountablerecovery.net website and tell us when people get it right. Because at the end of the day, what we want to do is make these systems as good as they can be because we want the Recovery Act to work. We need it to work. We're in dire straits in this country and people are suffering and we want it to get better. And I just want to close by saying, um, not only do we want the recovery to work, but we have this moment now. It's a very special moment where we can really reshape the way democracy is working. We have a president in the White House who's clearly committed to open government, who's committed to citizens having a voice, and we have a citizenry that's more engaged than it's ever been. We have people who are paying attention because they really care what government's doing, and it's our moment to go in there and say, here's how we need to change the structures so that everyone can be involved in decision making, so that every person has a choice. So let's not lose that that's what we're using this transparency and this technology for. It's to reinvigorate democracy and really make sure that it serves all the people. Thank you, Catherine. We're about to go. Go ahead. <laughs> We're about to go to Q and A in our audience in just a minute. And I want to remind our remote audiences to email us at questions at openthegovernment.org or call us at. 202-478-5325, I feel like National Public Radio, <laughs> or 278-202-478-5326. Vivek, did you want to take an opportunity to respond to, to what Catherine was just laid out there? Yeah, I totally agree with everything you're <laughs> <just> saying. <laughs> no, and part of it is, um, you know, as we're balancing moving quickly in terms of making sure that we're creating jobs, with rolling out the platforms uh, that are going to enable the very transparency that you're speaking of. Uh, one of the things we're doing right after this is there's a whole session where um, I've got my whole team that's coming in and on top of that the architects uh, as we're looking at data and data feeds and how we can make sure that you know, you're not getting it in static formats but you're getting it in formats that are machine readable so you can slice and dice and cube all that information. But um, again, I think we on the public sector side want to hear from people. We want to know what the best way to, to make this happen uh, and how quickly we can move forward in terms of execution. Uh, and part of the challenge is there's nobody that has a monopoly in the public sector in terms of the best ideas as far as moving forward. And as I said, one of the biggest challenges we face is those 10,000 plus systems uh, you know, that have code from 30 years ago. And that's gonna take some time. And as Beth mentioned, it's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna happen overnight. But on top of that, when we look at just the scale, federal, state, local, and the private sector, we also have to balance um, how much data we're able to collect, you know, versus the burden of reporting. And what is the right balance uh, between collecting all this information and uh, making it available rapidly uh, against getting that funding out there and ensuring that we're building systems uh, from the very beginning. That's why I, uh, I spoke about how it's very, very important as we buy new systems in parallel to how we make our current systems transparent that we bake that into those systems because that wasn't part of the culture, that wasn't part of the DNA historically, 
and technologists didn't think about it in the same way historically security wasn't thought of in that way. It was thought of, as Dan mentioned, you know, it, it was either you have a secure platform or you have an open platform that can be compromised. And we reject that view. And what we're doing is we're trying to ensure, on the one hand, all new systems that are bought in the federal government take everything you've said into account. At the same time, with the Recovery Act, we want to make sure we get the best thinking. And we've met with a lot of the open government groups to actually work on a model architecture. Um, so moving forward, we can scale it across the entire federal government and not limit it to the Recovery Act. Uh, I have a question you may not be able to answer, may not want to answer, but to what extent is the problem that face not only with these legacy system um, outdated and all, but what is, how much of the problem is with proprietary systems and information encased in proprietary formats? Sure, so a, a lot of these systems, you know, so, so if we look at uh, the, the nature of these systems, we're looking at COBOL. Right, as uh, the, the code for some of these systems. Now, if you want to make a change um, on that system and the architecture, or even add a field to better track funding, you're talking about looking for a workforce, right? When you're talking about jobs, uh, finding people who are COBOL experts that are going to come in and touch those systems. And a lot of these systems are mission critical systems. Um, and so what ends up happening is you end up putting uh, a lot of people on the problem itself. Right. And so it's a human capital issue. So a lot of these processes are then solved through human intervention. Uh, but when that happens, you increase the error rate. And there's a culture in government that worries about putting out bad information. Right. My view is we need to put out information because the public sector is making decisions based on that information anyways. Right. So. That's the balance that we have right. to struggle with. Right. OK, I'd like to open it now to questions from the audience. And I'm going to start with one from a remote, and we'll try to go back and forth. Um, Mary Alice, I think we have a couple over here. Are there some back there? Oh, OK. Start there, you and you. OK. But I'm going to alternate them with questions for the remote audience. And these are heavily policy oriented. Um, first question is, um, I don't have a location for this one. Uh, I would like to know if President Obama's administration will adopt the open doors policy concerning meetings regarding any financial issues. I would like to know that our administration will not allow situations such as Cheney's closed door energy related meetings. Thank you. I guess that's you start. I'll start on that one. So l let me say that at this, um, so it's an excellent question uh, about the uh, approach that needs to be taken with regard to um, transparency in the way that government engages in its operations. The memorandum itself is very clear on the question of um, creating greater sunshine and an openness in the operations of government, not only the data of government, which means that we need to address issues like how we conduct the business of government and how we do so in the open, balancing transparency and sunshine and sunlight against effective working pra practices that don't, as we know, sometimes the, the, wrong, the wrong approaches to sunlight drives everybody into the back room. It's, you know, we don't want to be holding meetings in the bathroom. Um, as I like to say, um, but so this is definitely on the radar screen, and I think you know we are in this phase of taking input and listening and getting this feedback and hearing and knowing that this is a, an issue that's important to people. It's already been you know put by the president himself on the radar screen as an issue that we uh, are addressing and will address, and so we're in this period now of thinking about how practically um, to craft these policies how best to get there to achieve both the right policy and also the right cultural norms um, that move us towards government in the open, but effective government in the open. So I think, um, you know, without a doubt, this is on day one, this was put on the agenda, is something that I know the White House is working on um, and that we are looking to craft the right policy there. So looking for not only the questions, but suggestions about how you see this, particularly from this community in particular, how you see this as most effectively taking place. So we're definitely looking for that kind of input. And just on, on that note, I know that you will be putting up a site for people to submit ideas. Uh, OpenTheGovernment.org uh, has also created a Google group, um, Open Government Directive at Google.com, and we will be posting. You've heard that several of us mention the meetings this morning, and if we have time, Sean Moulton will, will give you a little update on uh, policy people coming together to talk about what needs to happen with the directive. 
Um, but all of that information will also be put up, and we are inviting people to continue to the discussion. Patrice, can I just uh, mention yeah. one thing uh, on the last question? Just looking back at the transition as, right. a, as an example. So during the transition, uh, we had a, a lot of outreach, and a number of folks in the room were part of that session, and, and the transition benefited from that. There was a clear policy during the transition that every meeting we had and every document we had be made available to the public at uh, change.gov. And so I think that the precedent was set for exactly the type of thinking that Beth is uh, talking about now in terms of how do you then bring that type of culture and policy into the operations of government. So, okay. Question back there. And would you please identify yourself? My name is uh, Dave Torgerson. Uh, I work for USDA, but I'm here on my own uh, volition. Uh, I have a question for, uh, that, that I guess it would be focused on uh, Ms. McAfee. Do you intend to give report cards I'm sorry for Ms. Carl. <laughs> uh, do you intend to give report cards to CIOs? Because I'll just say, as an observation, as a longtime government employee, sometimes the CIOs are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Number two, and I hope that this new breed is not going to be like that. <laughs> Number two, are you going to do that for the states so that you basically have a report card the way consumers reports rates automobiles? Um, the state level report cards have, are under discussion. And we're talking about how you would do those in a way that's fair and accurate and really rates people. So I think you'll see in the next few months state coalitions that are emerging to press for more accountability and transparency in the, in the state distribution and allocation of Recovery Act funds that will be getting those report cards. Um, we haven't talked about it at the federal level, but maybe that's an idea that the coalition will take up. Okay. We're going to do another one from the uh, remote audience. and near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's for the San Bernardino League of Women Voters. Uh, I am concerned about the storage of federal documents and even emails. What will historians of the future access in order to write future biographies and histories? Will information be stored and accessible to future historians? And I would add to people who want to hold the government accountable. <laughs> so like, any of you, Beth? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start on this one. So let me say that one of the um, first groups that I reached out to when I started this uh, role was to the National Archives and Records Administration team, to the government printing office, to the people who uh, are responsible for um, making government information accessible, for getting government documents out there, but for also keeping the legacy, the history, the archives um, of our documentary history and of the work that's being done. Um, so that's definitely very much, I think, the question of how we, and there was a conversation this morning, a whole working group was focused on, and there are some meetings, I think, taking place next week to look at this question of how we create the interface now between new Web 2.0 technologies, the opportunity to create active engagement, rapid participation, blogs, wikis, use of new technologies, much more dynamic forms of participation, and still balance that with keeping the history um, creating the archives and bringing transparency to the work that has been done. Um, so there has also been, there are, um, this is definitely the work that has been going on around government, is on the radar screen, and I think again, one of those important topics um, that uh, is surely within the scope of what we're focusing on, which is not to lose sight, and this is with regard also to the work that's being done on uh, uh, st stimulus and, uh, and transparency, is again, this is also about keeping the history of what is the new New Deal, in effect, um, and ensuring that our transparency efforts and the policy around transparency keeps account of the importance of that historical record and the transparency that comes with that, the accountability that comes with that. Can I, can yeah, sure. Absolutely. I just want to make a quick comment to um, Vivek. And when you, we, we're acutely aware of, of the unevenness of um, what's going on inside the federal government in terms of their ability to use technology. And that's why everyone, I think, in, probably in this room, and I know out there that are listening, are so hopeful about the recovery.gov website. Because you're in charge of it, and you're starting from scratch, and you know what you're doing. So the idea that that would be the central website um, for all this information, and we envision just a single page form that people go in and fill out, it could be an online form to report on how they're spending the money. So very simple, go straight to you, and then can go back out to states and localities and be public information and make it available. But so, so all our hopes are pinned on you, and we hope that you'll be the, the precursor of big, great changes to come across the rest of the world. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> okay. Please from Ireland, uh, one uh, very important document politically that I've not seen as part of the current discussion is congressional communications to the agencies. 
as you know, uh, well-heeled interests go to Congress all the time asking them to write letters to the agencies on their behalf. I wrote many of them myself uh, when I worked at the Hill early on in my uh, career. Uh, and if you want to get access to those, you typically have to go to the congressional liaison office and copy them. They're very inaccessible. Why not make those documents, which are very important politically, available? In fact, why not require congressional aides to fill out an electronic form so that they're instantaneously available in a well-structured format? Uh, I mean, this is influence being exercised in a very low visibility way on the agencies, so uh, the federal government actually has discretion uh, to disclose, disclose that information. Anybody want to? So, so, yeah, so I mean, uh, what I would say is absolutely. Um, beyond just those documents, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at all business processes across the federal government. Um, and one of the things that's been fascinating um, is you'll see how many people it takes to move around a business process. Uh, and, and the challenge is making sure that uh, we're rapidly, one, automating those business processes but more important than that is ensuring that as, the, as we're automating, we're not just recreating processes, taking them from their current format to uh, a new format that's webified, but uh, completely changing the way that process works so it, one, is efficient, two, you lower the friction in terms of how work gets done, and three, you make it completely transparent and open. Um, and as I said before, starting with a default setting that says, hey, this should be transparent rather than let's secure it. And that's part of the transformation that I, that I was talking about earlier. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Another question from, the, from our remote audiences, and I think this has to do with a lot of states, or a number of states anyway, are uh, really especially related to education expenditures. They're essentially putting their checkbook registers up online so um, the public knows what is being spent, what the contracts are, what's being spent um, on all sorts of things, but particularly education in this context. So this question is from Hartford, Connecticut, and it's, when will we see government checkbook registers maintained in real time on the internet or even updated daily? And I think that's probably yours. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on, the, on that. We're actually beginning with the Recovery Act. Well, one of the things that happened in the federal government was that we actually created a treasury account for each agency. So now you'll be able to track in terms of how that money is being spent because part of the confusion was you had these outdated systems and money would be rolled into uh, a financial management system and it was being tracked differently by different agencies. You couldn't even tell where the funding was really going. So by a function of having these separate treasury accounts, you'll be able to see that on uh, recovery.gov as funding goes out um, in terms of where it's going, how much, what it's for, and moving forward with states and locals, that's where also, you know, ensuring that those systems all, uh, are capable of, one, pushing out that information, and two, making sure that as that information is pushed out, it's done in, a, in an enterprise standard, rather than having to interpret, you know, 50 different standards plus all the local governments plus the federal government. And that's why the next session where we get into the architecture is vital and uh, making, it, it, making it available in different formats like Atom 1.0, RSS, XML, so people can uh, manipulate all the data as you suggested. Yes. Uh, my name is Leanne Nurse and I'm representing the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. I also have a day job at EPA. Um, <laughs> this is mostly directed to Beth but also to the other panelists. Um, to what extent do you think the Open Government Directive will incorporate the kinds of principles for civic engagement that are being developed through NCDD and other related organizations or perhaps the steps that we established at EPA uh, for effective public participation? Great, and I'm glad you brought called attention to um, this document which was floating around um, and the work that NCDD and others have been doing uh, um, to try to bring attention to the idea of principles of public engagement as well as principles of transparency. Um, and NCDD was, has actually participated in some of the outreach sessions that we've done 
um, and help to share those both during the transition and then now um, in the new administration. So um, we will definitely speak to, I mean, this is, though this is, we're focused here on transparency in part, this memorandum on open government focuses squarely on all three of these principles. So I think no one to the exclusion uh, or out of balance with the other, which is very much about encouraging early and effective participation. Um, EPA has been really at the forefront of modeling out new practices and really bringing innovation and trying new things. Not simply the uh, traditional practices of APA-based notice and comment rulemaking, extraordinarily important, one of the things on our radar screen, uh, federal advisory committees, science advisory boards, the traditional structures that we've seen before, but work that's been done around the government and more of which needs to continue to get done um, to try to bring innovation into participation practices. Um, so the, without a doubt, I'm glad that you, to the, to this audience, the larger audience have re-signaled the importance of the public participation, public engagement in decision making, which I think everyone has echoed on the panel, um, that this is about really trying to bring the public and the expertise of the public and the engagement of the public into the way that we make decisions, um, and at the same time getting us to push out some of those challenges and questions so that not all of the decision making or problem solving happens on the government side alone, so it's not only the participation agenda but also the collaboration agenda, but definitely those principles and the kinds of things that have been articulated by the civic engagement community whom we have uh, invited to come to the White House and uh, will engage in a larger conversation going forward online and, and through other meetings in trying to push forward on bringing meaning, meaning to those principles in practice and driving that out to the agency. So I also want to commend not only the interest groups but the agencies who've done a lot of work already to date in trying to use new technologies, but I think most important to echo what you said, new practices and processes that aren't just about putting up a blog or putting up a wiki. Everybody wants to throw up a wiki now, right? But unless there is someone listening on the other end to what comes in, we can have all the public comment websites we want, but the goal here is to try to change the practices of the way we make decisions, again, not easy to do, so that we're creating meaningful processes and technologies that serve as the conduit, and then in turn allow us to take the account of and get manageable and effective expertise in and perform the way that we really make decisions so that it's an effective process, not just a slick new tool and technology. Thanks. Question from a remote audience in the center, San Bernardino League of Women Voters is, is very engaged. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, this is a good question, though. Is there any nation, not, though? This is all. This is a good question. Is there any nation in the world that is already doing open government well? Have we looked at models that work? So, uh, I mean, a, a couple of models um, uh, are come from different places uh, around the world. Singapore. Um, has a tremendous, uh, and uh, they've been working at this for years. They have a very open uh, electronic government platform with, with many of their tra transactions online. Um, uh, m several of the U.S. Uh, trading partners that are uh, engaged now with the government that Vivek is now working with um, are looking at this area. The U.K. has a, a, a basically a, a government gateway that they run a lot of transactions through. Um, so there are any number of governments, and there's a whole international e-government uh, movement uh, that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, is involved in, and uh, so there are a lot of different uh, nations around the world that are working this, this problem, and the U.S. government is, has been and will continue to be in sure engaged with them. Hi, this is Laura Engdahl. In a past life, I edited a publication called The New Public Innovator, which was a Clinton era uh, newsletter that shared uh, ideas about how government agencies could, could do, could act more accountably. And um, of course that was a different technological era, but I'm wondering, I think this is a question probably for Beth, but maybe for Vivek also. Uh, two questions, uh, are there going to be any efforts to share ideas so that people working in government um, have tangible examples of when these, this kind of participative government leads to good decisions, and then secondly, are there going to be any efforts uh, to, to put the mechanisms in place so that this is sustained uh, into future administrations? I'll try to be, let me try to be brief. So first first to say, um, and I'm glad you mentioned the work that's been done in the past because we are of course uh, building on the shoulders of giants, if you will. We have been through reinventing government once before, 
Um, and now technology has really brought us to a new place in which I think our efforts at reinventing government are not only building on what's come before, but enabling us to try really tremendously new things in terms of our ability to uh, engage in policymaking innovations. We are committed to, as part of this process um, now and going forward, showcasing the innovations that are taking place around government. Because by no means we didn't arrive on the scene to a, to a blank slate. Um, there is work that's being done. Your colleague just mentioned some of the work, for example, that's been done at the EPA. So what we want to do is also to shine a light on what's been working um, and to get feedback in what's worked, what, what we can do better to take innovations forward to the next step. Um, and I also, to that, uh, and, and that gets to the collaboration international point, we have had outreach to already um, international CIOs, international governments, gotten feedback from them, looking at what's being done and are engaged in international dialogue as well as a dialogue across agencies now. Our interagency process um, that's been going uh, uh, already has participation from 50 agencies that have weighed in. Um, and that's very much about not only soliciting ideas around policy, but showcasing and finding out about innovations amazing things that are taking place um, and that we want to celebrate since they are moving us towards transparency and openness and greater innovation in the way that we make policy. And I think uh, just to add to that, uh, a couple of things have also happened you know, since the early effort. One is just Moore's Law uh, uh, in terms of computing power. Uh, two is uh, what, what, what's happening is there's mass personalization when it comes to technology overall. And that's not unique to just the, the consumer sector, but also now moving towards the public sector, which is how do you personalize government for individuals? Because from, from birth to death, uh, the public sector will touch you in so many different ways. And how do we ensure that at the point you care about a certain service, that it's delivered at the right time, uh, so information is relevant, to give you a small example, uh, during the inauguration, uh, just through da democratizing <laughs> data, there are a bunch of applications that were created as a result of a competition called Apps for Democracy. And one of them was just a simple application uh, so you could find out on your iPhone what the closest metro station was uh, and when the next train was coming uh, based on where you were standing or uh, whether, based on where you're standing, you know, what the, the rentals are available on Craigslist. So what you're seeing is uh, a movement towards mass personalization, and then also the birth of uh, the third window, which is not the TV and not the computer, but the cell phone. So, so massive deployment of services to the cell phone, and uh, the South Korean government has done a good job in terms of really personalizing services on on um, uh, mobile computing, they think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn, uh, not just from South Korea, but uh, especially from the developing world, where they have to provide government services at a low cost, whether it's how you conduct the census or how you deliver services uh, to eradicate poverty or disease. Can I add something? Yeah. This is back to what you just said, and then the question, the, the previous question about um, participation and other countries that did better with participation because I think there are lessons in the developing country there too you know there are a lot of experiments now with participatory budgeting where people come together and say what their priorities are at, at different levels um, India Indonesia Brazil is where it got piloted and we do not have the best right to know laws in the world in the United States anymore there are better right to know laws in India and Mexico and South Africa and now Indonesia so we need to recognize that, that there are other places that have, first of all, better legal structures to work on and that are really working on bottom-up participation. The UK is also doing a lot of new experiments around, but it's um, a kind of top-down participation, which is sort of interesting. The government has decided people aren't participating in, 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 um, in government and democracy enough, and so they're reaching out and trying to pull people in at the local level and all the way up to the federal level. So there are a number of places where where governments are really working hard on trying to figure out how they can can engage citizens in a different way. I just want to acknowledge one question from the uh, remote audience and, and tell the person who asked about the best approach for appealing an appropriate, inappropriate denial of a FOIA request. So we will get back in touch with you and, and put you in touch with some folks uh, who can help you with that. I don't think that this is the, <laughs> the best panel for that. Uh, although following one, another question, so I'm going to take another question from the remote audience, um, and it has to do with that sort of personalizing government, I think, ties into that. Uh, how does the Obama administration plan to 
Balancer mm -hmm. address the dynamic tension uh, between open government and transparency and the need for protecting individual privacy? Sure, and, and I think everyone looks at uh, this challenge through one prism, right, which is that it can't be done. Uh, but, but, but the way I think we have to look at it is just like in life, in the physical world, uh, people decide, you know, based on credentialing and what information they want to share to receive a specific service. We need to think about it in the same way when it comes to the digital world, which is it's, it's, it's great to be able to participate and engage um, in an anonymous fashion as you're uh, commenting on an issue or advancing an agenda. But then when it comes down to uh, receiving a specific service, credentials have to be verified. And that's a trade-off. Rather than thinking of it in terms of one solution for everything, what we need to think about is how do we ensure that based on whether it's a service or the level of engagement, we're asking for the appropriate credential at the time it's needed. Not up front, but at the time it's needed. And engineering systems and the public sector to adopt that model rather than a model that says we're going to ask you for the uh, the most restrictive credentials so you could participate and engage with the government. Can I just add that um, actually tra transparency is a fundamental to the proper um, delivery of privacy uh, in the government. Access to information about individuals, notice to those individuals about what the government's doing with their information. So I'm. I fully agree with Vivek. I, I think it's a false dichotomy to suggest that the two are, are antithetical. And I think, the fa in fact, as transparency is developed more effectively uh, over the coming months and years, that we'll see greater attention to privacy. And we just need to keep focus on educating people, making sure that government decision makers make the right decisions about the information that they have so that they're not uh, inadvertently uh, placing information on individuals in the, in the wrong place and that sort of thing. But keep moving in that direction. Thank you. Local audience. Good afternoon. Uh, Don Purcell, Catholic University School of Law. My question is about the use of complete computing cloud technologies. I was wondering whether the transition team or the Obama administration is looking at choices and options on the use of computing cloud technologies to store, maintain, and retrieve data in a searchable format. And we only have five minutes left for this part of the thing, so please keep your questions and responses short. Cool yes. Questions. <laughs> yes. So, yes, yes, we are looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's strength central to our strategy, actually, in one of our key pillars, which is uh, lowering the cost of government operations. Um, and if you look at what's happening in the consumer space and cloud computing uh, and the Darwinian pressure that exists in terms of innovation in the consumer space, we want to be able to bring that same type of pressure and innovation in the public sector by leveraging cloud computing. Uh, but we have, you know, through the transition, we talked about three different clouds. Uh, one being leveraging consumer clouds. Second is cloud computing when it comes down to uh, government operations where it's sensitive but unclassified or classified information. And third is rethinking the way or looking at how grants are issued. So if you look at Virginia, Maryland, and DC, the federal government would give grants around specific programs, but they're not allowed to deploy common technologies jointly, which would cut the cost of uh, rolling out the services by order of magnitude 60, 70%. And so th that's sort of the approach, which is looking at the consumer cloud, the federal cloud, and the state and local cloud. Now, the Google gave a major presentation this morning in this area. And that's the reason I asked the question. I wanted to see the extent to which this really interesting presentation this morning matched up with what the transition team and the Obama groups look at. So good answer. Thank you. We're going to take a couple more directly locally. <laughs> Richard Lehman, Citizens Planning Coalition, D.C. So my questions or points get are more ground up. Um, one point, I guess, is a sort of student of government Reinventing government wasn't really about democracy. And hopefully, I mean, from everything you've said, I think that's a significant difference in terms of business process redesign versus transformation of government. Um, because not a whole lot happened, really, with those books and stuff from we, we really 16 years ago. OK, okay <laughs> here we go. Here we go, then. Um, Congress is really important. 
we can't communicate with congressional committees. All their systems are set up for you to contact individual Congress members. If you live in D.C., you're, you're out of luck. And so much of Congress's business is done by committees, and we can't really fundamentally communicate with them. If Regarding information... I'm sorry to interrupt I, you, but... I just you make know, one more point. If, that, it, if it's about the executive branch, because these folks are... I, I understand yeah. that, and this yeah. is. Don't forget defunding the archives so that very, they have much more limited hours now. Similarly, how do the various agency libraries and other information systems fit into this initiative, not just the CIOs, but actually these entities that are already existing, like National Agricultural Library, et cetera? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure there was a question in there, well, so I think we should take okay. uh, Let's take a couple of questions okay, so that we yeah. can respond to as many as possible. I'll try okay. to work that into a response. Okay, um, I'm, my name is Eric Mill. I'm with the Sunlight Foundation. And I think this question is primarily for Vivek. Um, there's been a lot of talk about just getting, um, getting data out to people um, and getting input from people in a sort of like holistic way. But I'm wondering specifically about uh, developer contributions and ways to, have, like, if you're a developer and you're not part of a big organization that can afford to get certified to participate in the procurement process, like, how can you participate? So, like, and I can see two ways of doing that, like lowering the barriers to procurement, but also actually putting out government projects on services like SourceForge, GitHub, stuff like that, you know, where people can see where they can contribute code and see at least a, the path of it being accepted and integrated into government systems as a motivator to help people contribute. Do you, do you see anything like that? Yeah, Coming absolutely. Work? And, and I mean, my, my experience um, in the public sector and especially the way I've, I approach a lot of these problems has been to engage the public in helping us solve some of these problems. That some of the work we did, and uh, one of the things that uh, the Sunlight Foundation has done is the competition, Apps for America. In the same way, what we're really looking to do is uh, figure out, one, how do we engage people? Because there's a hunger in terms of technologists who actually want to come in, and they want to do it for free. They want to give back. And we want to be able to tap into those people. Historically, uh, the government's reaction would be, well, only government people can touch certain things, which, which is fine. But there are a lot of problems that need to be solved that, that are not sensitive, that are not classified. And uh, with the ability of leveraging the talent and the ingenuity of a lot of these developers, uh, rather than going out there and spending more taxpayer dollars on uh, expensive solutions. So Beth and I have been talking about this at length in terms of how do we engage an entire army of technologists to, to help us solve some of these really difficult problems. Participation takes many forms, and we care about the participation that comes in the form of coding as well as that comes, you know, code is left coast code as well as right coast code. Whether it's comments on law <laughs> or comments on code, we're looking for both forms of engagement. Yeah, Tom? Uh, I'm Tom Quick with us question. from the Tom. Government Accountability <laughs> Project. And this question uh, is applying the request to hear from us and the call for collaboration and participation to current events. Um, last week, there was um, some uh, confusion and uh, controversy about the administration's views on whistleblower protection. Uh, on Monday, there was just wonderful breakthrough in the scientific integrity policy. Then on Wednesday, there was a signing statement that led a Republican senator to engage in very sharp attacks on the administration's uh, commitment to that issue. Um, my question is, um, for the people on the, the webcast, watching the web, and uh, the members of our organizations, the whistleblowers, where do they direct their views uh, on, this, on this issue? Um, you folks at the front have been very gracious and supportive for how the activists can channel our voices. But uh, where does the public at large, how do they weigh in, weigh in on this one? Whitehouse.gov is one natural place uh, to, to engage in uh, uh, dialogue and on top of that to actually contribute comments. Yeah, and in addition, I mean, we've already spoken about this. You owe us an input next week, you've promised, that you're going to send us some reports and try to gather feedback and input um, from a much wider community that we will then channel back to us through our open government web presence. So we're looking forward to that. and. We, again, welcome the collaboration of groups who are helping to channel these conversations and discussions so that we're getting in manageable feedback um, that helps us uh, shape and craft our policies now in this uh, crucial phase. One final question. 
Thank you. My name is Jared Duval. I'm a fellow with Demos, where I'm working on a book uh, called The Open Source Society. And my question, I think, is, is best uh, posed to Beth, and that's on the participation specifically in the policymaking process. One of the things that uh, I've been looking into is the, the great work that's being done both in person by groups like America Speaks in their 21st Century Town Hall meetings and online. <laughs> we have folks here from America Speaks and online through projects like um, what was done between Open Left and Red State when there was a net neutrality bill being developed uh, by Senator Durbin's office. I'm just wondering, what are, you, what are some of the options that you're looking at in terms of how citizens participate, either through America Speaks type models or online uh, open source policy formation going forward? Oh, so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, Looking at looking at uh, looking at innovations both in I mean I think I've sort of echoed this already. Looking at innovations in traditional practices and looking at how we uh, create new processes and practices again, just to echo what was said before. This is about looking holistically, not simply at whether it's a blog or a wiki or whether it's a single deliberation methodology, though I very much come out of this world of um, people who've worked on uh, dialogic and deliberation methods and tools, um, and, um, and there are many uh, method, methods and tools that are out there, but is it looking at now, how do we marry up the methods and tools that exist with the problems that we're trying to solve, not a one, it's, the goal is not to find one single solution to all problems in the participation area, just like in the services area. It's about figuring out what are the different models and how they can be brought to bear, how do we make those tools and processes and practices available to people who want to use them, and then to encourage through policy and through technology um, the use and the trial and error, frankly, with new types of processes. And we know one of the things that we have to get comfortable with is uh, trying new things. Um, and that means that some of those things might not always work, and that some of those things might work better in one context than another. So I don't think you know, this, that there is one answer um, or one method or one way of doing things, but instead trying to move towards practices whereby we're trying lots of different things and making them available to people to experiment uh, in different contexts. Because whether we're trying to crowdsource gaining expertise, or whether we're trying to get people work on collaborative drafting, or whether we're trying to get people engaged in um, uh, attempting to provide a, a, um, a sense of sort of, you know, sense of sense or consensus around a particular issue, these are different techniques that are going to work in different areas. So I think one thing I'll just add to this is an important dialogue that's emerging between the technology communities that weren't traditionally engaged in the world of the kind of dialogue around civic engagement and participation in the same way, and the many active people who've worked in the area of dialogic methods, deliberation, civic engagement, policy processes, bringing these two worlds together to now talk about how we drive more effective practices and innovate in our practices for policy making. So look forward to seeing the book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I would really like to thank our panel for their time, for giving us time and coming to talk with us today and for a lively and thoughtful dialogue with all of us. Tell my audience what. Oh yeah, I am. <laughs> we are now going to take our discussion to a somewhat more specific set of recommendations. Um, joining me is Ari Schwartz, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Center for Democracy and Technology uh, for a presentation on a report just issued by the Center for and OpenTheGovernment.org. Show us the data, the 10 most wanted government documents. The report was made possible through the financial support of the Sunlight Foundation and the work of the Center for Democracy and Technology and OpenTheGovernment.org. Special thanks go to Heather West and Judd Watkins of CDT and Amy Fuller of OpenTheGovernment.org. Ari, you've been involved in several reports of this nature. Can you tell us a little about them and, of course, this one? The history goes back, actually, to uh, 1998 when, uh, actually, John McCain was the chair of the, Senator John McCain was the chair of the uh, Commerce Committee, and he had his staff uh, looking into uh, making government more open and uh, one of the issues uh, we went, we would, a lot of the open government groups went to uh, the, the chairman and asked him uh, to change policy, and they, they, they kind of put back to us, well, what are the exact types of data, and what are the exact areas uh, that you want to see information made more, where you want to see information made more open? Can you be more specific? And from that idea, we worked with OMB Watch and coming up with this 
uh, 10 most wanted list. But where we ask the public, rather than just coming up with our own list, ask the public, please send us the types of data that you want to see. And uh, at that point in 98, we did it through email. Uh, people just sent us uh, email, you know, e emails of the, and we, I still have the uh, very, very long Excel spreadsheet we used to sort through all the, all the, uh, li the list that we got. Um, we put together a top ten list made up of all three branches of government and tried to uh, come up with uh, what, what, what we thought, calling the best ideas from that list. Um, in 2004, the, uh, the, the, the well, and I should say in, in that, Four of those documents uh, have been released, including one that was extremely successful at the time. Was we, the U.S. had no Supreme Court website at the time, even though Mongolia did in 1998. Um, so, uh, one thing that we were uh, we, that what happened within six months was the Supreme Court got an official website, and by the uh, Bush v. Gore decision, uh, that became one of the most downloaded documents of all time. Um, and so, uh, at that, to that point, so uh, it showed really that there was a need. Uh, to get that information out there directly to the public rather than filtered uh, and through filtered sources. So uh, we were able to, uh, um, uh, to to move that discussion along. A lot of people thought it was very successful. We repeated it again in 2004 with Open the Government, who then existed at that point. <laughs> um, and uh, at that point, because of the, the nature of the, uh, the, Bush, the, the Bush administration's views on openness, um, it was a, a lot more confrontational. I think you, if you look back at the results, a lot more political information was up there. Um, and uh, then, uh, and I think it raised a lot of the profile on, on uh, some of the uh, anger from the open, uh, openness community uh, in this space. Um, and then you know, five years later, we decided that uh, because, as, as Catherine said, really uh, the, the, the feeling of uh, excitement about a new administration that was committed to the idea of openness coming in, could we put together a new list um, that, that captured the moment, uh, got, got feedback from a lot of people using even some of the new Web 2.0 technologies to do that. I think we, we, we put that out uh, in a way, working with the Sunlight Foundation to, to, in order to get a list together. Um, we found some of the limitations of trying to do this uh, at the, you know, within such a short period of time to try and get it within the first 100 days um, and get feedback in that time. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we have on in the report that we put out, we have a list of uh, what people voted on. But we put together our own list, too, because a lot of the good ideas came in the last days, so people didn't have a chance to vote for things that had just come out. So we put together a, kind of a, a, what we considered some of the best ideas out there as our top 10. But uh, you can take a look, at, and the site's still available, too. You can see all the information and comments that people had, which are uh, uh, really very interesting. We're very excited about uh, how, how much uh, input people had uh, to, to the process. Thanks, Ari. Uh, so we wanted to review with you a few of the 10 most wanted documents from this survey. And the audience can see, actually, the people here in the local audience got a handout that has the cover on one side and the 10 most wanted on the other side. You should have gotten it at the front desk anyway. Uh, the, uh, the remote audiences can see uh, the information on the website. And the uh, report, full report is posted on both of our websites, I'm sure. Uh, we only have time to discuss the first few, as we want to leave a couple minutes for questions, and we may even cut out some of these. Um, Ari, why don't you say a few words about the first one? Sure. Well, uh, 10 years ago, the number one document on the list, both that we thought was number one and that the public voted on, was Congressional Research Service reports. And again, this year, number one votes, and, and the one that we feel have felt is the, is the kind of the most egregious case in, for, for information is uh, CRS reports. Um, the, the, it's the only document to make uh, all three top ten lists that we've done. Um, the, the Congressional Research Service uses taxpayer dollars to produce reports of, on public policy issues, and these reports are made accessible to Congress through a website that is in, internal to the Congress, uh, but is, are never released directly to the public um, and directly from CRS. And members of the public can ask for them through the reports through their members of Congress, but they need to know that they exist before they can get them. Um, Third-party websites such as OpenCRS, which is run by uh, Center for Democracy and Technology and, and, and made possible through the, the work of a lot of other groups, um, collect and share reports for free. Uh, but the, the only way to get, uh, the, but for years, the only way to get the uh, reports and it was from for-profit companies, which were somehow able to get through uh, the, the barriers that Congress had put up to get access to these reports uh, um, for for a cost for twenty dollars a piece in some cases. So. Uh, um, we, we, the public obviously still uh, feels very strongly that these reports should be made directly available from the Congress. Second uh, most wanted was information about the use of TARP 
Troubled a Asset Relief Program and bailout funds. The, the TARP authorized the use of taxpayer money to purchase assets from financial institutions that were struggling and is often referred to as the bailout. After $300 billion in bailout money has been distributed, the actual use of the money by individual companies is still largely unknown, and as you know, TARP and the bailout have morphed and grown. For those of you who want to follow what we do know uh, about the bailout, please come to bailoutwatch.net, a site run by openthegovernment.org. The, the number three, I don't, I don't know how much time I'm going to yeah. spend on these, but uh, um, the, the we, there were a lot of votes for judiciary documents, and, and number one on that list, the only one that has never been on a previous list, that uh, the highest highest re receiver of votes that have never been on a previous list was the uh, PACER system, the Public Access to Court Electronic Record System. Um, and the PACER system provides uh, federal court records, including opinions and cases, um, and the public uh, the public have access to the legal precedents only after a user has previously registered for a password. Uh, and the system charges uh, far more per page than it costs PACER to serve PDFs. So the, the, this is information that is available but for uh, a price and, and uh, only through uh, a system that, that makes a profit uh, based on really burdensome fees to the public. So um, that, that a lot of uh, people who really care about, uh, who've cared about judicial documents yeah. have uh, raised this and, and uh, became uh, one of the cause plebs in the uh, top 10 most wanted this year. I think we're going to, uh, because we really are running late, uh, open this to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, let, me, let me just add one okay. quick thing, which is um, that, that we did try to make talk about some of the things that we were optimistic right. about this year. Uh, and uh, um, we did that 10 years ago as well. Where we tried to show things that were on the right path. Um, NASA made the list 10 years ago. NASA makes the list again. So there are some agencies that uh, have continued really to, to have a high level of interactive services to try and use the internet to its fullest capabilities. Um, you know, we, we've added some other ideas like USA Spending.gov on the list that are government-wide. Um, the, the, we, we also are, we have this new category that um, we, we, we call not there yet, but we're optimistic, um, which is data.gov, recovery.gov, um, and the release of um, the OLC memos, um, the Office of Legal Counsel memos, on torture, um, which was actually one of the highest vote getters, and while we were in the middle of the process, the the, the White House released. So um, we, we we are. Uh, I, I do want to add that the report is uh, trying to catch or capture some of these op this optimism right. as well about where things are headed. Right. And we encourage you to read the whole report. Yeah. Uh, Sean Sean Moulton with OMB Watch, and a actually, I, I think you were getting to to exactly my question. I mean, this is Ari, especially this is your third time, and <laughs> Teresa is your second time doing this report. With the emphasis now on open government and transparency, especially from the administration, uh, but with the increased attention that Sunshine Week gets every year, do you have higher hopes this time than, than before? I mean, you got, I, I think you said, Ari, you got four of the original first 10. Uh, do, you, do you think that at the end of this year, or by the time we do an, another one of these reports, we'll, we'll get 10 out of 10 or six out of 10? <laughs> Well, I, I I do hope that it raises the profile on some of these uh, some of the lesser known things. You know, one that um, that I knew a little bit about, but not enough to to, to put it on our original list was state uh, Medicaid plans and, and waivers. But it's something that the people in the healthcare community care a lot about, and it turned up someone added it very late in the process, and it got a lot of votes for being so late in the process. And uh, you know, I think think raising some of those issues will get attention. Uh, and you know, Beth. Novak said to me earlier today that she'd like us to, she asked me for a copy of the report and wants us to send it to, to them. So I think that that's a um, you know, great sign that uh, people are listening to the, to the report uh, and that we can keep this going. We have time for one short question. Yeah, my name is Li Yang. My short question is really for the ongoing, continuing basis of the data, which is really should be systematically looked at, investigated. And that means uh, including the connection of all agencies from local to federal. So if you have money and she's shuffling around, or the Medicare 
uh, use or revenue or expenditure are misused uh, and actually it's not benefit the general population or the federal court or local court, district court, they really connected because the court system is really from local to federal. Yes. So those information are not available. Right. So a lot of complaints and cases are there and they are not even docketing or pleading, right. I know you even docketing. And maybe they have some one some several cases with the same case number. So I would like you really, based on these complaint cases and uh, at the administrative level and, uh, and a higher level, put them all together. Okay, if you can drop us a note about that, send it to questions at openthegovernment.org and we'll follow up. Hey, I am I Li Yang. Yeah. My email is L Y O U N G. No, you don't want to do that on a public broadcast. <laughs> no, no, no. What well, that I well, means, I would like to work with you. Just okay, good. For yes, years. thank you, thank you. If we'd like to thank all of our sponsors, including and especially the Center for American Progress, and of course all of you, our live and remote audiences, and our panel of guests for joining us today. I apologize to any folks who didn't get to ask questions. A more open and accountable government at every level is up to all of us. We invite you to join us in our work. OpenTheGovernment.org again has set up a venue to continue this discussion. Open Government Directive at Google.com. We invite you to join us there. Thank you very much.